pleasure to be here. I, I, I have lots of opportunities to go speak all over the country and the world, um, but this I think is the first time I've had a big audience like this back home. It kind of makes me a little bit nervous. I think I remember being in this room at, at a 4-H dance in <laughs> junior high, and I remember being really nervous then too because we were supposed to ask girls to dance and that sort of thing. So the other reason, you know, that's a little unusual, I've got my family here, so sometimes I tell stories about them in my talks. Uh, but now I've got somebody that can, you know, check to see whether I'm actually telling the truth. So that's a little nervous. I've also got my uh, brother-in-law here who's a, a, a preacher in town. I also told him it's a fair play because I, I've got to hear him preach lots of times. Now he gets to hear me. So uh, anyway, but it, it's fantastic to be back in Lubbock. Um, I uh, look back fondly, um, you know, about my time here as an undergraduate. It really formed my thinking. Growing up in this area, hoeing cotton weeds will do a lot to influence your outlook on life and make sure that you're successful so you don't have to go back and do those jobs. Um, and I think it, this, this university helped set me up for a really successful uh, career and I'm really thankful for that. Uh, what I wanna talk about tonight is, is really the future of food and, and really more than that, sort of the fight for where that future is heading. And I thought I'd start off by telling you a little bit of a story here. Uh, several years ago, I got the opportunity to do a sabbatical in Paris. And so uh, those are my two sons. Actually, Harrison is in the audience. You can see he's a little bit older now. Uh, that silly hat he was wearing, that's probably the last time he wore it in that picture. Um, but you know, one of the things for those of you that have had the chance to go to Paris on vacation or live there know is that Paris has fantastic department stores. So I think this is Galleries Lafayette, there's pre -tops. And um, when we first got there into our house, one of these big department stores was down the street from our apartment. It was called Bon Marche. And we thought after we got unpacked a little bit, it'd be really fun to go there and just check out the department store. And one of the really neat things about this department store is that in addition to the fancy perfumes and purses and clothes, that right across the street, they have a food hall. And this food hall is absolutely magnificent. And we were walking around in there and we thought we needed to get a few groceries just to eat some things for the next couple of days. And I'm walking around this you know, department store with my jaw sort of on the ground. And you know, this is the picture that I have up here. This is you know, just the aisle of teas. And the wall with butter and cheese was literally as long as this wall here. And I was just amazed. But you know, I, I turned around and, and looked at my wife and she was sort of starting to tear up a little bit. And I said, well, honey, what, what's wrong? And, uh, and she was just overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, there were all these varieties and options. We had, she had no idea how to make the normal recipes that we cook back home. You know, there was no sour cream or we couldn't even find the cheddar cheese. There were thousands of cheese, but we couldn't find the cheddar or the American. Um, and so, uh, you know, and so, you know, the other thing she kind of might've might been going on in the back of her mind was the fact that she knew we had to lug these groceries back about six or seven blocks up about five flights of stairs without a, you know, elevator. So she might've been a little worried about that too. But you know, when I think about my wife's reaction to that food environment, it's a little unusual. Um, you know, throughout most of human history, the biggest challenge has not been, what am I going to do with all this variety, but rather, am I just going to have enough food to eat? The reality is, of course, that we all face this kind of variety every day. Go, go to your Walmart here in Lubbock. The last time I went to my Walmart in Stillwater, Oklahoma, I counted the, number, the numbers of the different types of bread in the bread aisle, and there were over 100. So the reality is that we face this kind of abundance and variety every day. We just don't notice it because it's so common. And it takes getting out of our sort of, you know, comfort zone to get into an unusual environment for us to realize really how much abundance that there is available to us. But really, again, just to reemphasize re this point that that you know, ability to be overwhelmed by the amount of food variety that we have is a very recent phenomenon. And in, in fact, if you go out, go back in time and you look at the leading intellectuals of the day, so let's go back about 250 years or so, um, what you see is that the intellectuals throughout most of human history have been really worried about, about whether we're going to have enough food to eat. And the person who is probably most well known with these ideas is Thomas Malthus. He was writing in the late 1700s. And what he looked at when he looked at, he lived in England and he saw that, you know, England's a small island country, a relatively fixed amount of land. And his concern was that he saw population growing and he, he employed this concept we economists call diminishing returns. And he realized that if we keep adding more and more people to this fixed amount of land, the amount of food available per person is going to fall. And eventually we're going to end up in the situation that he called misery and vice. That we'd have this really large population that's continually on the verge 
of starvation. So many of you have probably heard of the Malthusian problem or the Malthusian trap, this is it. And this is a concern that he expressed, you know, 250 or so years ago. So you might be thinking, well, that was back then, you know, those days are over, right? Well, let's fast forward another 100 years. This is a, a writing or a speech actually given in the late 1800s by um, Sir William Crookes. And he was giving this uh, address to the uh, British Association for the Advancement of Science. And he basically expressed the same concern, but in a different way. His concern really was the Americans, those of us in this room, actually, we weren't born yet, but our forefathers maybe. And you can read what he has to say there, but basically he said, you know, there's only so much wheat to go around. Um, the, it's almost certain that within a generation, the ever increasing population of the United States will consume all the wheat grown within its borders and be driven to import. And so, you know, this became such a concern. Actually, there's a name for it. They called it the wheat problem. What are we gonna to do to produce enough wheat for the growing world population? Okay, well, it's just another old guy, right? Those concerns are over. Well, let me fast forward to almost current day. Um, this the, is Paul Ehrlich, if I can get the next slide to come up. Um, he wrote a book in the late 1960s called The Population Bomb. And the opening words of that book in 1968 were that the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of anything we do now. Um, you know, obviously those sort of pessimistic doom and gloom outlook on life is pretty popular because you can see him there on the Johnny Carson show. In fact, he appeared on the Johnny Carson show almost 20 times. Um, so for those of you studying ad communication, one of the things you know there is that bad news sells uh, and will get you an audience. But the other thing it tells you is that this concern has not gone away. That again and again throughout history, and this is not some, you know, uh, I was going to say he's not a crazy person, but this is a leading intellectual. He's a professor at Stanford. He's been making these claims over and over, and you see it again and again and again. So, of course, these guys are right, aren't they? Everybody in this room is, is starving. Well, actually, let's take a look a little bit at the data. So this is data from some researchers at the University of Oxford. Um, and this is just calculating the, the percentage of the world's population that's in poverty or extreme poverty. So if you go back to the early 1800s, they calculated that over 90% of the world's population lived in poverty. Today, it's less than 15%. Now, 15%, it's, it's still too high, but boy, that's sure a whole lot better than 90% of the, of the population living in poverty. Now, this is just the opposite of what Malthus predicted. He, you know, his concern was that actually we would have an increasing <laughs> share of people that live in poverty. And in fact, if Malthus was right, what we should expect to happen is that we all in this room should be paying more for food. Because if there's less food available per person, you and I are going to be competing for each other for this dwindling supply and be driving up the prices. But instead, what we see is that prices of food, at least as a percentage of our income, have fallen over time. So back in the 1920s or so, about uh, one out of every four dollars, about a quarter of, of people's income was spent on food. Today, it's about only about 10 percent. Um, now, that's, that's, some people look at that and say we should pay more for food, but I look at that and say that leaves 90% of your income to spend on all the other things that you enjoy in life, like getting to go to Red Raider football games, getting to go to the Buddy Holly Museum, buying that iPhone, all those things you can afford to do now because you only have to spend 10% of your income meeting what is one of the basic necessities in life. Uh, you know, it's not just, you know, dollars and cents, it's things like, you know, health and life. You know, we're living longer. Um, back in the early 1900s, people only lived to about 50 years of age on average. You know, today, living 30 years longer. Uh, for whatever reason, you women continue to outlive us men. Maybe we do risky and crazy things we shouldn't do, but even, even men today live 30 years longer. Now, this isn't just because we have a better food supply. We have better sanitation, better medicine, a whole host of things, but certainly access to a, a, a more affordable, more nutritious food supply is one part of the reason that we're living longer. And in fact, again, just to kind of point this out, you know, the, the, the sort of Malthusian prediction um, is, is totally wrong with the observed facts. It, it, what we can see is, in fact, uh, while we have gained more people, there are actually many, many fewer farmers today than we've had in the past. So before about 1950, there were six and seven million farms in this country. Today, there's about two million. And really, it's a lot less than that. Um, if you cal calculate the percentage of farms that actually produce any substantive amount of food, what you can see there's, there's really only about 160,000 farms in this country that produce 80% of the value of ag output. And so you can see this actually with USDA data too, that, that since the 1940s, we uh, today are producing about almost 200% more food, but we've been doing it using less land 
and importantly, an opposite from what Malthus predicted, less labor. So that, this seems to me like an absolutely amazing achievement. We're getting a lot more using less, using fewer of our environmental resources, and freeing up labor so that we can do other things other than having to hoe cotton like I had to do when I was a kid. I can be a professor and live in a nice air-conditioned office. I can afford to do that now um, because of the, of the kind of advancements we've seen. So you might be asking yourself, uh, why was it that Malthus was wrong? What was it that was not in his equation? And the answer is innovation. Human ingenuity and the application of science and entrepreneurship to food and agriculture. And I think it's hard for a lot of people to sort of realize that the consequences of these changes they've seen. So I had a piece in the New York Times a couple of months ago, and I, I tried to think of an intuitive way to illustrate these dramatic increases in productivity growth, in innovation that we've seen in food and agriculture. So I did a little thought experiment, and my thought experiment was like this. Let's imagine we wanted to eat, say, the same amount of beef that we ate in 2015, but instead we wanted to do that using 1950s technology. And by technology, I basically mean yields. And what I calculate there is that if we did that, if we wanted to eat the same amount we actually ate as a country in 2015, but instead we're using 1950s technology, we would need about 15 million more beef cows to do that. Now that's literally cows. I didn't include all the you know, steers and heifers and feedlot cattle. We would need 30 million more dairy cattle if we wanted to eat the same amount of and drink the same amount of dairy that we ate in 2015, but instead we're using 1950s technology. We need more than 220 more million acres of corn acreage if we want to have the same amount of corn we had in 2015, but instead we're using 1950s technology. So these are absolutely incredible increases in efficiency and gains uh, in, in efficiency that we've seen. And so really if I had to sort of summarize, um, you know, the sort of back history, it, uh, it, it's, I couldn't do it better than this cartoon I found. You can see the, you know, you got this bomb that landed and these scientists are looking at it and they say, well, it appears to have landed, but it didn't explode. So what you might think then is that again, throughout history, we've had this concern leading intellectuals telling us we're not gonna be able to keep up with population growth. People are gonna go hungry. People are gonna starve. We're not gonna be able to produce enough food. And we're looking around today and actually the statistics look better. Actually, we're doing a better job feeding people than we ever had. In fact, actually one of our biggest problems today probably is that we're actually eating too much and we should probably be eating a little less. And so you might think that, that the, the common view for people would be to say, whew, that was a close one. Right? We, we averted this you know, calamity that has been predicted for 300 years now. We can you know, really sit back and think, boy, we're really glad that that didn't happen. So anybody that's picked up a book about food and agriculture, probably done any you know, searching on the internet knows that is not the prevailing, food, um, prevailing view about food and agriculture. And so indeed there's something uh, that I would call a food movement. It's not actually what I call it, it's what they call themselves. And um, it's a movement that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. So there's a lot of popular best-selling books. You have folks like the Food Babe. We have our former first lady who planted a garden out in front of the White House. Uh, we have new NGOs and labeling standards. We have a bunch of food policies like mandatory labeling for GMOs. Uh, we have place, folks like the New York Times that are hold, hosting food conferences and food policy conferences. By the way, they didn't actually have any real farmers from this part of the country or any part of the country for that matter at these conferences. But the important point is these people have a view about food and agriculture and it's a view about food and agriculture that is starkly at odds with what I just outlined. It's a, it's a view that suggests that actually agriculture is sort of in shambles that we're raping and pillaging the land and um, it's a food system that sort of run amok. It's not, a, it's not a view that says, boy, we really got lucky with, uh, with what, how history turned out. And so if I had to sort of summarize the prevailing view about food and agriculture that stems from this food movement, I'd say it's a view that suggests that we as consumers are eating too much sugar, too much meat, too much processed food, too many pesticides, we're spending too much on healthcare. And the idea you get when you read a lot about food is this image I took out of Time Magazine. It's Ronald McDonald, he's running on the treadmill, he's eating everything he wants to, but you know, he just can't quite keep up. And it's a view not just about what consumers are eating, but about agriculture itself. That somehow agriculture is too corporate, it's too monoculture, it's too subsidized, and ultimately at the end of the day, it's just unsustainable. And the image that you know people are left with is this view of agriculture. This one, it's a, a screenshot I took of one of the Chipotle commercials. This was before Chipotle had their problems with E. coli. But it was a view about agriculture that's just sort of a soulless, lifeless machine that's just cranking out of food 
food where there's no human involved. And if you look at these books, again, um, these are just a sampling of the many books on these su uh, subjects. We, I know you can't read the subtitles, so I thought I'd pull out a few of them for you just to sort of indicate the prevailing view there. And it's, uh, it's talking about food where there's a hidden battle or there's some dark side, somebody's taken over, there are hidden toxins. Uh, you know, I think it's amazing there's so much hidden about the food system when there are so many best-selling books <laughs> about these topics. But, you know, I think this actually in one way is a sort of playing on this idea that because we have so many people, so few people that are today involved in food and agriculture, that um, in some ways this has created a big disconnect between what people can believe about food and ag and the people who are actually producing the food. And one of the ways that can be exploited in these kind of books, we don't know about food, let me tell you my side of the secret story that you don't know anything about. So these folks do have a view about what they think the future of food look, looks like. And it's an alternative production system and it's a system that manifests itself in a whole bunch of different ways. But if I had to sort of sum it up, I'd say it's a, it's a kind of a return to nature, a romantic traditionalism. And you can see this in all sorts of forms, you know, it's a call for more local food, more organic, more slow, more natural, more unprocessed. Now, there's nothing wrong with those kinds of food. And there's a lot of positive things we can say about those kinds of food. Um, the, the problem though, is that many people are either not willing or able to pay what it costs to produce food that way. So I think the real challenge is for a lot of folks in this food movement, they, they have this food movement they advocate for and they're telling people they should eat these ways and, they, and, you, and you look and people don't eat that way. So the market shares for these kinds of products are far less than 10%. So they get really frustrated. So then they say, well, we need a whole bunch of taxes or subsidies or a whole bunch of new regulations or just a lot of social pressure, like somehow you're a bad person if you're not eating the local organic asparagus. But I think you know the, the sort of common mantra or sort of the philosophical underpinnings for a lot of this is that you know somehow agriculture in the 1940s or 50s was an ideal that was those were the good times lots of small family farms not a lot of corporate involvement uh, people had a connection with food and ag and and it's the kind of food system we should get our back our, get ourselves back to and again these are a couple of screenshots out of those chipotle commercials where they're trying to use this image of that 1940s agriculture as some kind of ideal we should aspire to and get ourselves back to. But let me show you a picture of, 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 a, of a 1950s agriculture. Um, this is my dad who's sitting up here and his siblings in Silverton, Texas in about 1940. Um, I don't know about you, but that doesn't look like those images in that Chipotle commercial. <laughs> you can see one scrawny old cow out in the background, a lot of dirty and dusty fields and a lot of poor farm kids <laughs> that are sitting there. And the reality is, if you looked at those farming practices that were being used then, in a lot of cases, they weren't all that sustainable. And when technology came along to folks that were farming then, they rapidly embraced those technologies because it let them be a little more productive make more efficient use of their land. And frankly, a lot of times it let them live a little bit more like the people in town and enjoy a little higher quality of living. So again, there's nothing wrong with those kinds of, of production systems. But I think most people have lack, lacked the connection to know what it's like to actually live the 1940s and 50s agriculture. And so, you know, and I can see this in my surveys. I do lots of surveys all the, uh, uh, every year. I do, actually do a survey of a thousand U.S. food consumers every month. And uh, here's one of the questions I asked them one month. I said, do you, just overall, do you think the state of food and agriculture is getting better or worse? And if I add up the percentage of people who say it's either much worse, a little worse, or about the same, it's 75% of the American public. The other question I've asked them before is uh, once I asked people, what do you think the biggest problem is in food and agriculture? And they could give me any answer they wanted to. Um, and then I followed that up with this question. I said, okay, whatever you think the biggest problem is, what do you think is the most effective way to address that problem? And I just gave them two options. Uh, and you can see the big winner by far was to adopt a more quote unquote natural production system, more local, more organic, versus this more scientific or technological production system, more innovation, more science, more research. Now as somebody who's a agricultural and food scientist, I found this slide very depressing. And so I think the challenge here is that we all know there are food problems, but how are we gonna deal with them? And you know, it doesn't have to be either or. We have a big food production system. We can use lots of different methods, but I think it is interesting when forced, if people have to make a choice about what kind of system they think is more desirable, it's a sort of retrograde, romantic traditionalism kind of system. 
So what I thought I'd do is just spend a few minutes, you know, I, I, uh, if you buy my food police book out there, you see that sometimes I like to be a little argumentative. So I want to challenge you a little bit and maybe some of your conceptions here, because when we think of, again about this idea of what the future of food should look like, we have to evaluate the alternatives. And one of the alternatives that's being proposed is a system that's where most of our food comes from more local sources. Now, I wanna be very clear here. I am not against local foods. We should enjoy that local wine tonight. What I'm against are bad arguments for why you should buy local food. And again, I think there's a lot of reasons maybe you might like to buy local food. And I do wanna say, you know, I, I do have some, uh, you know, credibility things here. That, again, this is a picture of my dad and his siblings. You know, he had, they had chickens in their backyard. My mom had chickens in her backyard in the 1940s in Amarillo, Texas. You know, we had backyard chickens in our backyard and our family before it was cool. All right, so I'm not against you know, local foods per se. And why do people like to buy local foods? Because it's fun to do. You might like to have a few chickens. Sometimes it's a little tastier. You can have a little more variety. Those are all, and sometimes we just like to meet the people who produce those foods. So those are all good things in their own right. And I'm not, I don't have anything to say negative about those things. But those are all private pleasures we get from buying local food. What I am gonna take issue with is somehow the idea that you should pay for my <coughs> local watermelon. Um, it's the idea that somehow we should use government policy to subsidize local food production or policies that have actually been enacted in a lot of places. We should require, for example, local schools or hospitals to say source you know, a certain percentage of their production from local sources um, or jails, for example or even the state of Connecticut, I think recently, you know, by state law, have no idea how they're gonna enforce that, said that you know, all of state purchases of food by some you know, future date, uh, about 15% are gonna come from local sources. It's those kinds of policies that I'm gonna take issue with. And because if I have to be fair to the people that are critical of our kind of modern agricultural production system, one of their arguments is that there are externalities in food production. That you know, you know, my production practices are imposing costs on the environment or on health that are not being incorporated in the price of food. So I think the, to be fair to them, what we have to do is take an alternative that, that they advocate for and propose and ask, will their alternative have any meaningful impact on the environment, on health, or on those things that you know, they have concerns about and that frankly I'm concerned about too. So what I'm gonna do is just take some of the more popular arguments for why we should buy more local foods and give you a little bit of take on those. Well, one argument is you should buy more local food because it's good for the environment. And normally the argument is, this is a screenshot I took off of a sort of local foods advocate site, is that you know, we spend a lot of miles transporting food. So the average tomato you know, travels about 1,500 miles. So it seems kind of obvious, right? If you, did, if you didn't have to you know, transport this stuff 1,500 miles, that's obviously good for the environment. You, less, you use less fuel, you have less greenhouse gas emissions. That's true, but if you look at the research, what you'll find is that 80% 80, 80 of the environmental impacts of food production occur on the farm. So what that tells me is we wanna make sure we're growing food in the most efficient places possible because more efficient means using less resources. And actually, as it turns out, that the transportation piece of the food equation is a relatively small piece of the puzzle. You and I typically have a much, larger environmental impact driving our cars to the Walmart or to the United than does the transportation of getting that food to the grocery store. Why you put it on big trucks, on containers, and um, it's very efficient to move a lot of food that way. There's a lot of different ways I could talk about this research, but probably one of my favorite examples was a study done asking a question uh, as follows. Let's suppose you lived in London. Would you be better off, at least in terms of, in, of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, buying lamb that was produced in the UK around England or buying land that was grown in New Zealand? And the answer is you would actually use less energy importing land from over 11,000 miles away from New Zealand and getting it to London. Now, how in the world is that possible? Well, the answer is that New Zealand is naturally endowed with all those things that makes rearing sheep easy. Lots of good grass, lots of sunshine, and you put that lamb on a boat and you can ship boat, uh, you know, products by sea very energy efficiently. You gotta remember, you know, folks were sailing the ocean blues before we ever had fossil fuels. So you can transport stuff by sea pretty energy efficiently. Uh, you know, another example of this too is, and you know, I'm sure some of you've traveled. I always find it funny when I go somewhere like, you know, New York or Chicago in the middle of winter eating at a nice fancy restaurant and on the menu it says local cucumbers or local tomatoes. Where do you think those are being grown? 
almost certainly to the extent they're telling the truth in a, in a, a greenhouse that's being heated with fossil fuels. Um, so just because something is local does not necessarily mean it's good for the environment. Uh, you know, another argument though is, okay, well, it's not the environment thing. You know, surely we should sort of sub you know, create these policies that require folks to buy local foods because it's good for the economy. And you can see this manifested a whole bunch of ways. Again, these are just things I stole from other people's websites. You know, one is, well, for every $100 you spend, if you spend it locally, $62 come back to the economy. Whereas if you spend it non-locally, only $25 comes back. Well, there's one kind of logical flaw with that argument, that is there's an accounting identity. Uh, exports have to equal imports. If you in Lubbock keep spending $100 on, let's say, non-local food, and um, $75 of it never comes back, Lubbock's gonna eventually run out of money. But I still see money in Lubbock. You keep getting paychecks, so that money's coming back to Lubbock. Why? Because you're doing things apparently other people find valuable and you're trading with them. So uh, there, an accounting identity suggests these kinds of numbers can't even make sense on the surface of it. Well, another kind of reasoning though is that, well, this is kind of economic impact analysis. So often the way this gets portrayed is, you know, for every $1 you spend locally, um, then X new, do new jobs are created. So a lot of you have sort of seen those kinds of, of studies done before. Um, so in some cases, those kinds of studies make sense. Let's suppose uh, Toyota was thinking about building a new plant here in Lubbock. So really, you know, for the extra dollars that Toyota is bringing in, they really will create, you know, X new jobs from the standpoint of Lubbock. But in the case of local foods, you know, the question is, where does that dollar come from? That dollar was already here in Lubbock. It's not coming from outside the community. So the question you got to ask yourself is what would that dollar have been spent on otherwise? And it's not at all clear to me that the highest value or, or the, the way an economist would say it is the, the, the best, you know, the, that dollar has an opportunity cost. And it's not clear to me that, that, that the you know, best use of that dollar is necessarily on local foods. Well, let's say, well, Jason, I don't really believe that argument. I, I, you know, I don't buy either one of those. Let me give you one different one. So I'm the economist, so I'm gonna pick on the economic issue. Um, so let's suppose Lubbock passes one of these policies, you know, that all the, the public institutions in Lubbock are only going to source foods within, let's say, I don't know, a 60 mile radius of here. So that probably actually would benefit farmers within a 60 mile radius of here. Okay, but what happens when Amarillo does the same and Midland does that and Abilene does that? Now the farmers around Lubbock have lost markets that they could have had in Amarillo or Abilene or Midland. So I think the concern here is that you're thinking about the short term and not the long, long term. And when everybody's pursuing their own inward looking trade policies, you're not as well off as you could have been otherwise. All that's just a way of saying that trade is good. Uh, trade is a way we make ourselves uh, wealthier by doing things we do well and trading with others. Uh, you can see this even in the kinds of foods that we eat. So a lot of the foods that we really enjoy eating, whether it's uh, you know pork or coffee or peaches or wheat or uh, you know, pulled pork, any of those things were not in America before Columbus sailed over here in 1492. These are a part of the Columbian exchange. And so often we think about things that are so natural, like, you know, there's nothing more natural than an Irish potato, for example, or Italian tomato sauce. There were no potatoes or tomatoes in Europe until after Columbus discovered America. And so these things that we enjoy, we enjoy because we trade with each other. We, we have adapted things to our environment. They've uh, moved things over and we trade with each other. And uh, again, this is a lesson you probably learned in econ any economics class you'd have here in Lubbock or, or anywhere else. Okay, I'll, t I'll pick on one more uh, sort of argument people give for buying local foods and then I'll, I'll kind of move on to the last section here. But that is um, the health argument. That surely we should buy local foods because it'll be good for your health. Now, I don't doubt that a lot of us would probably do well to eat a few fewer Big Macs, I can certainly say that for myself. But the reality is, you know, you can eat healthy foreign food or you can eat unhealthy local food. I'm not really sure what local has to do with it. Um, and so, you know, some people will say, well, you know, produce is most nutrient dense when it's freshly picked. And that is true. But what, you, what that doesn't take into account is that in a lot of places like California and Florida, when they pick those peas or the corn, they're quickly frozen. So you go down that, that frozen produce aisle in, in United, the nutrient content of that frozen produce is just as high typically as the fresh picked product.
products. And in fact, if you look at it, you know, some people are involved in sort of community supported agriculture. They get a share, like a big box of food that comes from the farm every month. Or, you know, when I grew up in a lot near Wellman, somebody just dump a big bag of, uh, you know, uh, squash on our front porch. Maybe that's why I don't like local foods. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is, you know, nobody's going to eat that much local food at any, you know, at any fixed point in time. So the reality is that that produce is going to sit on your counter for a long time until you try to figure out what to do. If you don't believe me, just circle, you know, you know, Google CSAs and problems. And one of the things you'll find is what am I going to do with all this kale? So the reality is a lot of that food uh, ends up degrading and the nutrient content degrades over time to such a point you've been better off probably buying the canned stuff from the grocery store if you're only concerned about the health aspect of it. Of course, the other side of that too, just to mention that, is a lot of that food gets thrown away. Um, if you're only buying from food in a local region, all that produce is coming to market at about the same time because all the, you know, the weather is affecting the same people in the same area in the same way. So you get a lot of tomatoes at the same time, you get a lot of cucumbers at the same time, and so uh, there's been good data at a lot of farmers markets around the country that suggests a lot of that produce ends up getting thrown away. That's something that's not good for the environment, but also perhaps is not good for health uh, compared to some of the stuff you can buy in places where it's fresh, where production facilities are located next to canning and packing facilities that can, can uh, deal with that kind of production volume in a productive way. Now, another important aspect to health the health side of this is that one of, the, one of the key issues of health, if you talk to a lot of dietitians, is diversity of your diet. And, you know, somebody who's restricting their diet to only what can be grown locally is necessarily restricting their diet to a certain set of foods. And the reality is, you know, you want, this is a screenshot from Walmart. You go to Walmart any time of day, 2 a.m., any time of year, February, and Walmart offers us an absolutely incredible amount of abundance and variety. You know, you have, uh, I don't know, probably lemons from Florida and corn from Iowa, you have peppers from Mexico and places from all over the world. And so the ability to trade with others allows us to eat things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise uh, because we aren't just constrained to what we can eat locally. So again, I don't want you to leave here and say, well, what did you learn tonight? And say, well, I don't know, this guy Lusk told us uh, local foods are terrible. That, that's not my message. There's some nuance there. My point is, if you wanna buy local foods, you should go for it. And there's a lot of reasons to do that, but I would think carefully about public policies that are being designed to promote local foods. And what I would also caution is this idea that somehow local foods are gonna be any meaningful solution to some of the big food challenges that we have out in the future. So I think, you know, one of the questions I think that we have to ask is, you know, should we adopt one of these more natural production systems, whatever that means? And again, I'm not here to tell you what we should necessarily or shouldn't do. I just think it's important to understand the trade-offs that we're making when we adopt you know, different production systems. So if we want one of these more natural production systems, one of the things I think we have to understand is that probably one of the consequences of that is this Malthusian type concern. So this is data on different countries across the world. On the bottom axis is basically a measure of productivity. How innovative is your agricultural sector? It's how much food can you produce per worker? And on the other axis is a percentage of the population that goes hungry. Well, you can see there's a pretty clear relationship. The more productive your country is, the fewer people you're going to have hungry. So we can adopt a system that is less productive, but one of the trade-offs and perhaps one of the consequences we'll have with that is a country where there are more people that we, we really will have to worry about those sort of Malthusian concerns. Now, this is another graph that sort of illustrates that in the same way. It takes the world and it plots a country. The size of the country is the share of spending on food. So you can barely see the U.S. because we just spend a tiny share of our income on food. And the colors of the country are what percentage of that country goes hungry. And so by and large, there's a pretty strong correlation there. The bigger the circle, the more people in that country that go hungry. So if you're spending more of your income on food, most likely you have more people in that same country that are going to go hungry. So there are some real consequences to these uh, food choices that we're thinking about uh, making. Okay, so again, I, I do think it's important to say, I, I don't want to be misinterpreted as saying everything is fine and dandy. We, we do have important food problems. I don't think that's really the, the challenge here. You know, there, there are things like climate change. There's, there are growing concerns about obesity and diabetes. Even in this country, we still have problems with hunger. Um, we have problems with runoff. People are worried about biodiversity, ag labor, with commodity prices like they are today. We're worried about farm incomes. These are all real problems the question is of whether we have problems, but how we're going to deal with them. 
And so what I want to do is, is it, just to kind of wrap up is sort of end by giving you my thoughts on what kind of food future we can create that I think can meaningfully deal with those problems. And I think it's, a, it's an answer that we can actually see in our past. Um, it, you might be surprised to hear that Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, well-known um, literary person, also had a lot to say about farming. He gave a talk at a farm show in the late 1800s. Somebody asked him about this Malthus problem and he said, not, not so Mr. Malthus. And when he, when he tried to answer why are we not gonna follow this Malthusian trap, his answer was, well, we need a science in great numbers to cultivate the best lands in the best manner. So he, he actually understood how to get out of this Malthusian trap and to address, in this case, just the concern about hunger, but it's also the answer to a lot of different concerns, and that's that we're gonna need science and innovation. And we can see this in our own history. What are the things we enjoy about our food system today and how do we get them? We had folks like Eli Whitney, who figured out how to gin cotton in a much more effective way. Uh, George Washington Carver took this peanut and found all kinds of creative uses for it, including peanut butter. Uh, fo folks uh, at public universities and elsewhere created hybrid corn that had dramatic impacts on the amount of corn we could produce per acre. Um, Thomas Jefferson, as you know, was a big advocate of agriculture and sort of the agrarian lifestyle. What m most people don't fully appreciate is that he was also intimately interested in agricultural innovation and experimentation. So there are stories that he smuggled seeds in his coat pocket back from Europe to try them out on his farm. Uh, he also, when he sent Lewis and Clark out to try to find the Northwest Passage, one of the big things he told them is, I want you to bring back some new plants for me to plant on my farm back in Monticello. So he was intimately interested in this innovation, trying new things, seeing what's going to work. We have John Deere's plow. We also have interesting stories of uh, one person who was working at, a, at a, a company that made radars. He had a candy bar in his coat pocket. And he noticed it melted when he walked past the radar. And he thought, oh, maybe I can use these radars to cook. And that's how we got microwave ovens. And so, you know, the, if we look back in the past, we can say a lot of the things that we enjoy about our food system came about because of people being innovative. And so in my most recent book, This Unnaturally Delicious, what, what I do here is try to tell the stories of today's food innovators. So those other pictures I told you, that that's the stuff that happened in the past. But I think what's important for people to realize and what's not obvious to a lot of people is that there are real life people really trying to solve today's food and agricultural problems by using science, by using innovation, by trying to learn the tools they learned at places maybe like Texas Tech. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on a few of these people and then I'll conclude. So one of these folks is actually one of my neighbors in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This is David Waits. Uh, another important fact about him that you may want to know is that he's a graduate of Texas Tech University as well. He created this company called SST Software that has data on over 100 million acres of farmland in the world. And this, he's right in the middle of these buzzwords that you've probably heard related to big agriculture and big data and precision farming. And what he does, it takes data, for example, on these yield monitors that most farmers have these days. It tells them where they're getting more and less in their field. And being able to take that data and combine it with other types of data about soil moisture content and previous uses of seed and fertilizer and trying to figure out, you know, can we be more judicious with our use of fertilizer? You know, there's a spot of the field that didn't produce much. Maybe we shouldn't plant anything there. Or perhaps maybe we should apply more fertilizer there, but we really don't need more in that really, you know, dark green area. So the idea is that we, we can first help farmers produce more, but be more be smarter about it so that we're not pr produce, putting too much fertilizer on the land and, and so that it's not running off in our waterways. Um, you know, my colleagues at Oklahoma State University are taking this precision agriculture to its extreme. So this, they have this machine that decides how much fertilizer to apply plant by plant. So those little strange white things that are actually looking at the plant as it goes to the field and deciding how much fertilizer to apply. I think one of the important things to realize that a lot of people don't realize is that places like Texas Tech and Oklahoma State and Purdue, they've been working on these problems of food and agriculture for a really long time. There's one really cool research project at Oklahoma State University that's been going on for over 120 years. And these are the Magruder plots, the first professor of agriculture at Oklahoma State planted, plowed up native prairie ground, planted wheat, and what he wanted to know is how long could I continue to produce wheat if we never fertilized? And the interesting thing about that plot is it's still been planted today. If you look at the yields on that plot, what you'll see is they actually have higher yields today. They're getting more wheat per unit of land than they did in the late 1800s. How in the world is that possible? Well, the answer is this guy. This is our wheat geneticist at Oklahoma State University. They're planting better varieties of wheat on that land. 
So we're trying to figure out, you know, using the latest tools in genetics to figure out which kinds of wheat will produce more, which will be resistant to diseases. And these are the kinds of things that are happening at Oklahoma State. They tell you to write what you know about, so I wrote about my neighbors. But these are the things that are going on here at Texas Tech and all over the country with folks that have a genuine interest in trying to get, you know, feed a hungry population and make sure that we're using our environmental resources smartly. People sometimes say, well, this all this innovation is really great, Jason, but um, you know, what about the animals? You know, sometimes this resulted in this you know, consolidation of farms and you know, it's the animals who are suffering to give us these cheap food. You know, the first thing I'll say is animal welfare is a legitimate concern. It's something we should be concerned about. But what we have to do is evaluate the trade-offs that we exist. So one kind of gut reaction is, well, we need to take these egg-laying chickens out of cages and just let them roam free, right? Like Austin wants to do. Um, but what you have to realize, there's some consequences to that. And if you care about animal welfare and you let birds run free, there might be some uh, coyotes that want to eat them. There might be some hawks. It might rain on them. It might get really hot. They might get killed in a dust storm. So, we, you know, there's advantages to bringing them indoors. And that's one of the reasons producers do that. And it, they have these big open barn systems. But, you know, what you find is that birds tend to peck on each other. There's something, a real life thing called pecking orders. And so, you know, we want to give animals more room. We'd like to give them more space, but we've got to be responsible about doing that. And so even in these issues of animal welfare, we can still apply innovation in science. So these are some new housing systems that have been created that attempt to give animals a bit more freedom of movement, a bit more space, some nests, some scratching areas, but do it in a way that actually tries to improve animal welfare at a cost that we're still willing to pay. Also in the book, I talk about some economic innovations that we might use. Maybe we can use markets to help solve some of these problems too. Um, you know, a lot of you have probably heard about GMOs and that sort of thing. And, and you know, GMOs, when people talk about that, they think about it like Big Bag Monsanto or somebody like that. But I think the important thing to realize here is it's not just that. It's people that are concerned about malnutrition in developing parts of the world. Many of you have probably heard of this example of golden rice. So taking rice that's been genetically engineered to produce uh, beta carotene, which our body turns into vi vitamin A, that can literally solve millions of cases of blindness around the world. You can do this not just using GMOs. One of my former students is from Mozambique. They're breeding new varieties of potatoes there that have higher vitamin A and other vitamin content um, using traditional plant breeding methods. But the idea is we do have real problems, but we're going to have to solve it using science and innovation and genetics and these sorts of things. You know, back to this issue of biotechnology too, I think it's important to realize again, it's just not, it's, it's not only these so-called big bad companies. This is a team of students from UC Davis um, that entered a competition called the Internationally Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. And what they're doing is basically genetically engineering bacteria or yeast to produce things that we humans find valuable. So you might think, Jason, that sounds really weird. But you know, if you've ever had a beer or eaten bread, that's a yeast that produced something that you really found valuable. That yeast is eating sugars and it's turning those sugars into something that we humans like to eat. So you can get those yeast to produce other things too, like flavors, uh, vanilla, for example. What this team did is they used the, that yeast to solve a problem they were facing in California. The olive industry in California had been growing, um, but one of the problems that they were facing there is that they were trying to figure out how to compete with a lot of the European olive oils that we import into the United States. And one of the things that was news to me that they told me about was that um, a lot of the olive oil that we eat routinely has gone rancid. Um, in fact, they did a little taste test with people and they gave people rancid olive oil and fresh olive oil. What do you think most people preferred? The rancid oil. Why? Because it's what we're so accustomed to eating. And so, you know, what, what we need then is a test. How can we know which olive oil is rancid and which isn't? And at the time, the test was really expensive. It's really hard to do. And what they did is they figured out how to engineer a bacteria that could send off a signal when it detected uh, rancidity or these aldehydes. And it could send that signal to a little digital readout. And so this was a very practical application to solve a real world problem using genetics in a way that actually in this case didn't even involve the food or at all. It's a test they're using. So I could give you lots more examples, but I think I'll end on this one. In a, yeah, there's innovations on the farm and in food processing, but there's also innovations that may one day be hitting our kitchen. So for example, there are today 3D food printers um, that can print, prevent food. You might think, well, that looks kind of like a disgusting processed food. I think the important thing to realize is it's not just your normal processed food. If you want an organic local pea puree, you could put that into your 3D food printer. If you want to print out a granola bar in the shape of a you know, Texas Tech uh, Red Raider, you could have yours do that. Um, if you want to put a little bit of, uh, I don't know, maybe your cholesterol medication, this is customizable. 
This is a totally different kind of food. By the way, you can also uh, you know, upload your recipe onto your Instagram account. People can try it on their own 3D printing machine. One of the coolest versions of this too, I talked to a, a person who owns a robotics company in London, and uh, one of the things he did is he took the winner of Top Chef in, in uh, the UK, and he attached sensors to the chef's arm while the chef was making a meal in the kitchen. And all the while the computer is recording these movements while he's producing this meal. And they then record those movements and they can program the arms to exactly follow the movements of this celebrity chef. And they are literally in the process of making these uh, sorts of robotic arms. So the idea is maybe one day you get home, you've been a little tired, for work, you just like to kick up and you know kick back and watch some TV, but you got to you know get dinner on the table. Well, now you can literally go to your kitchen and dial up Bobby Flay or Martha Stewart and have their exact motions of their arms producing your meal for you in your own kitchen. Um, you know, another example that I'll end on is one that makes some of my cattle producing friends a little bit nervous. That is the ability to produce uh, meat without the cow. How do they do this? Well, they take stem cells out of an animal. These stem cells naturally like to reproduce themselves get a bunch of stem cells from a muscle, start forming muscle fibers, then you have a muscle, and that's all meat is. And so uh, there's folks, the, the guy I interviewed, Mark Post, he's out of the Netherlands, and um, his burger costs about $300,000 to produce. So they're a little ways off from producing something that is commercially viable, but this is the competition for the future, for the meat sector. And the idea here is that, you know, it's not just competition for our dollars on our dinner plate, but can we make sure that we're you know, producing the things we like to eat in ways that are using fewer of our resources, that we really can leave a healthy environment uh, to our kids and, and for our future. So you know, when I look out at the room and, and see the folks here, you know, I'm really optimistic. I see you know, people working in science, uh, in food science, and agricultural sciences who do care about our future. So I'm really optimistic about the future of our food system. And I think the way we're going to get a better food system is through science and innovation and growth. And so um, I look forward to uh, being a part of that food system. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks.